a little stiff from swimming. But I, not, I did not read, not books anyway. Now, cereal boxes, that was another story. Every morning I poured over boxes of Wheaties and Cheerios at the breakfast table. I looked forward to reading or look forward to new cereals as much for a change in reading material as for a change in breakfast fare. And comics, comics, I read them by the hundreds. Mostly I read cowboy and war comics, but I bought I bought them at a corner at corner stores and newsstands. Then when I was twelve, I got serious. I decided the comics should come to me. I got my first subscription, Bugs Bunny. Once a month, accompanied by the metallic flapping of the front door mail slot, the postman delivered Bugs' latest adventures to me. My favorite comic character of all, however, was neither man nor rabbit. In fact, I am still not sure what it was. All I know is that it was called The Heap, and it looked something like a haystack. The Heap never spoke, and the reader never saw it move, but The Heap appeared on the screen when people were having problems. Somehow or other, The Heap managed to solve the problem though it never got credit. As far as most people knew, it was just another haystack in the field. Of course, I read the newspaper comics, too. While I never missed Dick Tracy, Little Lulu, or Mandrake the Magician, my favorite was always Alley Oop. Another part of the newspaper got my attention as well. Sports. Mostly I read the sports pages of the Times Herald. I especially liked the clever writing of sports editor Red McCarthy in his daily column. Until then, I had thought there was only one English language, the language I spoke and heard in the west end of Norristown. I was happily surprised to discover that there was more than one way to say something, that the words and their arrangement could be as interesting as the things they said. From April to September, in the Sunday Philadelphia Inquirer, I read the Major League Baseball batting statistics. They were printed in small type in a large box, row after row of numbers and names, hundreds of them, every player in the majors. To the non-baseball fan, they were as boring as a page in a phone book. I loved it. I wallowed in the numbers. What was Ted Williams' batting average this week? Stan Musel's? Richie Ashburn's? Was Ralph Kiner still the leader in home runs? Who had the most RBIs? Did Mantle have a shot at the Triple Crown? Or Mays? It was like peeking at a race once every seven days, watching the lead change places from week to week. Cereal boxes, comics, baseball stats, that was my reading. As for books, I read maybe 10 of them, 15 tops, from the day I entered first grade until graduation from high school. I remember reading a few Bobsy Twins adventures and in junior high, sports stories about Chip Hilton, a fictional high school hotshot athlete. I read the adventures of Robin Hood, a Sherlock Holmes mystery, and Contiki, the true story of a man who crossed the Pacific in a raft. That's about it. Why didn't I read more? I could blame it on my grade school, which had no library. I could blame it on the curriculum, which limited my classroom reading to see Dick run, see Jane run, see Spot do something on the rug. I could blame it on history, for enrolling me in life and school before the time of book fairs and author visits. I could blame it on my friends, because, like me, the only books they read were comic books. But I can't do that. It's always handy to blame things on one's parents, but I can't do that either. My father had his books on display in the dining room. Thirty times a day I passed this collection of histories and Ellery Queen mysteries. Some of my earliest memories are of my mother reading to me. Stories like Babar and The Little Engine That Could. My parents steered me in the right direction. And the fact is, on those few occasions when I actually did read a book, I enjoyed it. Yet, for some reason, I would not admit to this to myself. Instead of saying, hey, that was good, that was fun, I think I'll read another. I would dump my baseball glove into my bike basket and head out the path to the Little League field, and months would go by before I picked up a book again. Reading a book was for times when I was totally bored and lacking anything else to do. And what about words, which, packed together, make up a book as cells make up my body? I liked them, yet this was such a naturally occurring, unachieved sort of thing that if someone had asked me in those days, do you like words, I probably would have shrugged and blithely answered no. Still, whether I knew it or not, words were claiming me. When I visited Harstein Printing, where my father worked as a typesetter, I saw words being created letter by letter, one thin slug of lead at a time. Once, in a comic book, someone with a bad heart was described as having a bum ticker. That tickled me to no end. I kept whispering, bum ticker, to myself for days. Except for the heap, my favorite comic book characters were Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. I liked them as much for their words as their ways. For me, the highlight of a scene was not what happened, but what Bugs or Daffy said about what happened. 
This is probably why Mickey Mouse never much appealed to me. His speech was too bland for my taste. When I was 11 or 12, my mother and I laughed for months over a corny old vaudeville joke that I kept asking her to repeat. She gave the joke a local twist. It went like this. Man goes to the beach for a vacation, goes into the water. When he comes out, he sees a lady sitting next to his blanket. He says, hi, I'm a little stiff from swimming. She says, hello, I'm a secretary from Norristown. I'm laughing again. Occasionally, I had to look up a word in the dictionary. Sometimes my eye would stray to the surrounding words. Invariably, it stopped at an interesting one, and I read the definition. In one such instance, I discovered that I was a gassoon. I clearly remembered two feelings attached to these moments. One, surprised that a dictionary could be so interesting, and two, a notion to sit down and look through more pages. I never did. And then, of course, there was my success in spelling. All of these items were indicators of an early leaning towards language, but I failed to see them as such. The tickle of a rabbit's wit, the rattle of alphabet in a comp... Comp comp I'm sorry, compositor's drawing, drawer, they simply took their place among the popsicles and pen knives, the bike tires, and the bike tires of my days, with one exception. In sixth grade, our teacher assigned us a project, make a scrapbook of Mexico. I found pictures of Mexico in National Geographic and other magazines and pasted them in my scrapbook, for which my father made a professional-looking cover at the print shop. Then I did something extra. It wasn't part of the assignment. I just did it. I wrote a poem. Three stanzas about Mexico, ending with a touristy, come on, now isn't that where you would like to be? I wrote it in pencil, longhand, my best penmanship on a piece of lined classroom paper. I pasted it neatly on the last page of my scrapbook and turned in my project. Several days later, my mother walked the three blocks to my school. She met with my teacher, who told her she did not believe that my poem about Mexico was my own work. She thought I copied it from a book. Ha! If she only knew how few books I read, and never one with poetry. I was suspected of plagiarism. I don't know what my mother said to her, but by the time she walked out, I was in the clear, legally at least. Five years would pass before I wrote another poem. That ends this chapter. Um, please take a look at your questions before moving on to the next chapter.